We have now done a number of these documentary or podcast style videos, which are immensely popular with the sort of diehard 10% of our subscribers and entirely overlooked by the other 90%, and indeed by YouTube's algorithms. So they have a small but devoted following, and I'm going to try to do at least one a week for a couple of months and see if we can get any kind of traction with them, since I think they're quite decent content, in my humble opinion at least. Today's video is a story from another A Half Time Report article of mine, and once again, we don't have a huge number of relevant images in our database, so you might be best treating this like a podcast, have a listen whilst at work, at the gym, or doing some other activity, since the video itself might not bring that much added benefit. Right, enough of that, here we go. If you ask any football fan to list the greatest national teams of all time, more often than not, the Netherlands team of the 1970s will crop up. Likewise, the great Ajax team of the same era is often pointed to as one of the finest club sides in history. Whilst the Ajax team experienced great success, winning three consecutive European Cups, the Netherlands national team twice fell at the final hurdle, serving as losing finalists in both the 1974 and 1978 World Cups. However, success was never the barometer by which these two teams were measured by when they became enshrined in greatness. It was the brand of football they played. The fluidity, technique and pace with which they played in a system whereby in theory, no outfield player has a fixed role and all individuals are comfortable joining in multiple phases of play, a system which became known as Total Football. The man largely credited with the invention of Total Football is Renus Meekles, who managed both Ajax and the Netherlands for a number of years, with Johan Cruyff serving as his main exponent. The other major claim to the foundation of the theory is made by Hungarian coach Gustav Sebs, manager of Hungary's golden team in the 1950s, who guided the country to just one defeat in six years, that defeat coming in the 1954 World Cup final known as the Miracle of Bern. Sebs implemented a very flexible 2-3-3-2 formation and demanded that his team both attacked and defended as a unit, requiring players comfortable in carrying out both tasks. In both of these eras, the early to mid-1950s and the 1970s, these two sides could be considered the antithesis to the British approach to the game. In 1953 and 1954, England lost first 6-3 and later 7-1 to Hungary, playing the traditional WM formation. The flexibility of the Hungarian forwards and midfielders baffled the English, whose rigidity was ruthlessly exploited and the humiliation demanded a major rethink over domestic tactics. Similarly, when the world were marvelling at the Dutch in 1974, England had failed to even qualify for the tournament, as Sir Alf Ramsey persisted with the outdated 4-3-3 formation which had previously brought him such success. The idea of the English as being behind the times and persisting with approaches less focused on fluidity and technique is one which has been commonly held for over half a century, and still lingers, or at least lingered until very recently today. This makes it all the more surprising that when one traces the origins of total football in both Hungary and Holland, they were led by Englishmen. Through the form of three men, namely Jack Reynolds, Jimmy Hogan and Vic Buckingham, the British radically revolutionised the game, and whilst these three men are still celebrated on the continent, they are relatively unknown in the UK. We will start with Jimmy Hogan, who was a former tobacco worker from Burnley of Irish descent. Hogan had a respectable career as an inside forward, an FA Cup semi-final with Fulham in 1908, proving the highlight of his 11-year career. He moved quickly into management, the Netherlands national team job proving his first venture at the age of just 28. He joined MTK Budapest in 1914, and it was there that Hogan began to refine his footballing philosophies, playing a vibrant style of football which sparked a national interest for the game throughout Hungary, which had never been seen before. When he returned to Britain in 1918, he was lambasted as a traitor for working abroad during the war, and he was soon on his way again. Hogan's managerial career spanned 29 years and saw him manage teams in the Netherlands, Austria, Hungary, Switzerland, Germany, France, and Britain. In Austria, he managed first Austria Vienna before teaming up with Hugo Mal to coach the Austrian Wunder team of the 1930s, who rose to prominence with a style of play firmly based upon moving the ball quickly and accurately. Unlike almost anyone before or after him, Hogan had a direct hand in two golden generations, and the success of the Wunder team in the 1930s was succeeded by the success of the Magical Majar in the 1950s. After the 6-3 defeat of England, Sandor Barks, president of the Hungarian FA, told the press, Jimmy Hogan taught us everything we know about football. 
Marx was not alone in his praise of Hogan. The Hungary manager, Gustav Sebs, went as far as to say, We played football as Jimmy Hogan taught us. When our football history is told, his name should be written in gold letters. Whilst Hogan's contributions had a major influence right across the continent, there was another Brit of the same era whose efforts were more solely focused in the country and city which would become so synonymous with total football in the 1970s. That man was Jack Reynolds. A year older than Hogan, and following an even more modest career, mostly in the second and third divisions, with the likes of Grimsby, Watford, and Gillingham, then New Brompton, Reynolds was to experience extraordinary success as a manager outside of Britain. After two years with St. Gallen in Switzerland, Reynolds was set to become the Germany manager in 1940, but such a move was halted with the outbreak of the First World War. Instead, Reynolds joined Ajax, where he would go on to change the course of footballing history forever. Prior to his arrival, Ajax had never won the Eredivisie or the KNVB Cup, and when he finally left, they had won the Eredivisie eight times and the KNVB Cup once. Reynolds spent seven years in his first spell at Ajax, taking over the Netherlands national team in 1919 and leaving for Blauwit in 1925, for a three-year break from the club. In total, Reynolds spent 27 years as Ajax manager in three separate spells. Although he made the club successful for the first time in their history, his legacy extended far beyond silverware. Reynolds' implementation of offensive and skillful play and a focus on youth has become ingrained in the culture of Ajax. Renus Meikles played under Reynolds for only a single season in the 1946-47 campaign, before Reynolds retired age 56, but his influence upon the man who is credited as the pioneer of total football is immense. Twelve years after Reynolds left Ajax, Vic Buckingham took over as head coach. Unlike Hogan and Reynolds, Buckingham had quite an impressive playing career, spending his entire 14-year career with Tottenham as a wing half, and losing his best six years to the war. Buckingham's first managerial venture was with the combined Oxford and Cambridge students team, Pegasus. He guided the amateur outfit to victory in the 1951 Amateur Cup, where he garnered a reputation for playing with such an emphasis on possession that hadn't been seen within the British game before. His first major job came in 1953 with West Bromwich Albion, where he almost pulled off a historic double in 1954, when he won the FA Cup, but the Baggies just missed out on the league title, finishing second. Supporters and the press were quick to draw focus on Buckingham's alternative approach to the game, with the Observer noting that his West Brom side were the only team in England to resemble the style of play employed by the Hungarians as they romped home against England that same year. He spent six years with the Albion before joining Ajax in 1959. He won the league in his first season in Holland and the cup in his second, but moved back to England in 1961, joining Sheffield Wednesday. A fourth place finish and a Fairs Cup quarterfinal defeat at Barcelona was not deemed sufficient by the Wednesday board in his final season, and Buckingham returned to Ajax, where he would hand a young Johan Cruyff his debut in 1964. In 1970, he joined Barcelona, taking over a team lying in 10th place in La Liga. In two seasons, he transformed the Catalan outfit, taking them to fourth in his first season and runners-up in his second, winning the Copa del Rey in the process. His successor at Barcelona was one Renus Meikles. Hogan, Reynolds and Buckingham have all had immense influences upon the beautiful game. Their contribution across the continent can still be felt and is widely acknowledged, with the exception of their home countries. Hogan and Buckingham have had their legacy somewhat tarnished in Britain due to scandals of treachery and match-fixing respectively. When one says that the true foundations for total football were laid by these three men, it is not too detract from the mastery of Renus Meikles, Gustav Sebs or Johan Cruyff, all of whom acknowledge the influence of their predecessors. The British, for the most part, turned their noses up at Hogan and Reynolds over the turn of the century at a time when the British game was far superior to the rest of the world. The English national team went unbeaten against non-British opposition on home soil for 77 years between 1872 and 1949, but whilst the British game stood still, the rest of the world did not. Sandor Bark spoke of the British attitude in 1993, commenting, British football was isolated. They didn't like the continental football. They felt themselves as the aristocrats of this game. Whilst Jimmy Hogan recounted being scoffed at when he returned to Britain, telling those in the game, we are not aristocrats. We are not the best. So today, HITC7s acknowledges the feats of Hogan, Reynolds and Buckingham as underappreciated pioneers. If this video does well and the demand is there, we'd be happy to do more in-depth profiles on any or all of the trio. 
That's it for today's video. If you enjoyed this type of content, then I suspect you might enjoy my book, which is available to pre-order now via www.englandsgreatestdefender.com. And yes, there is a link in the video description. The book doesn't come out until August, and I'll do a video all about it closer to that date. But for those of you who want to get it as early as possible, and for the best possible price, it is available via the website now. That's it for today's video. Thanks for watching, let us know your thoughts in the comments, and any future video ideas you'd like to see from me. Give us a like if you enjoyed the video, and as always, make sure to subscribe to the channel, and turn on notifications if you enjoy our content.